Welcome back. You're listening to the discussion, Technology and Great Power Competition, AI, Complexity and Competition, sponsored by Palantir on Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest today is Aki Jane, the Chief Technology Officer and President of U.S. Government for Palantir. Now, Aki, for a break, we were talking about this idea of, of AI and where it fits in the DOD, kind of some of the idea of use cases, how they're defining it. Uh, and I think one of the things we, we should go down the path of is because this came out in the Congressional Research Service report from November 2020, is one big challenge is so much of this is being done in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Some of this is being pushed out by, by, by folks like Palantir. Uh, is, is that a challenge for DOD? Because you know, do they have to bring it in and then modify it? And then that causes a whole other set of problems as we've seen for decades that as soon as you start changing the technology instead of changing your processes, mm -hmm. that, that all of a sudden now we're talking about a billion dollars here and a billion dollars yeah. there and we have real money. No, absolutely, it's a great question. So I, I think there's a few things. So one, uh, let's not forget the organizational behavior change. Absolutely, culture needs to change, the behavior of people needs to change and the processes ultimately need to change. They need to be updated and informed for this advanced technology that is that is now available and can uh, honestly improve a lot of those processes and, and kind of focus our human capital on the really hard problems, uh, not kind of the rote tasks. Again, why RPA is such an interesting technology to look at. Some of the CV applications are really interesting to look at. Um, having said all that, I think when, when I look at, um, if you were to compare kind of the advent of the internet and and kind of like uh, uh, how things kind of started there really on the defense side and kind of how the world, if they had paid attention to what was going on in DOD and other places, would have seen the future, right? They would have understood the interconnected world and a version of that. Um, and kind of networks and um, technology for telecommunications and other things, you've just seen uh, kind of DOD uh, being quite a bit ahead on all those things. I think when it comes to AI, and I actually think more and more we're starting to see this actually in the space kind of domain as well, um, I think you're seeing innovation from the commercial sector, um, and in particular the consumer aspects of the commercial sector leading, right? And I, I just, you know, use the simplest possible example here. Um, you know, uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, if you were buying a house, uh, how would you understand what comps are? Well, hopefully you've got a competent real estate agent, you know, they do some comps for you, they give you an idea, and then you bid on it. Now you can walk down any street in America, you can pop up Zillow or Redfin, and you can understand every house that's sold on that block, how much it's sold for, who it's sold to, and kind of get some kind of prediction on kind of where that market's going based on all the different signals and inputs that they have. And I think what, um, what that provides to the consumer is a form of decision advantage, you know, should they be looking to buy a house. Um, but really, if you think about it, if I'm a, a commander um, and I'm trying to make a good decision, but I'm spending 80% of my time working for the data versus the data working for me, and then I get like a minute of five minutes to make a really important decision, um, I need to flip that paradigm. And I think we've seen that happen in the consumer space more and more, um, and they're kind of leading. And so the question is uh, kind of twofold. What, one, how do we take and recognize those innovations and those um, capabilities and adopt them for DoD, right? Because some of those techniques are things that um, are very easily adoptable, some of them aren't. Um, and then second, where are there things that already exist in DoD I can just wholesale take and bring into, right? I don't have to reinvent or adopt or do any work to get there. And I think that um, what we found through our experience working with the department and frankly a lot of other commercial software companies, because we don't actually build models, right? Uh, we enable AI and machine learning operations, we enable data management, but we don't build models, right? We don't build and sell models. And so um, we work with a lot of other partners, both very, very small startups to some of the largest companies in the country. Uh, who are serving the department and doing great work. And in all those cases, what we've really found is it's a mix of the two. Typically, they have a commercial baseline. It can be adopted and trained and improved, uh, you know, what they call transfer learning, uh, to help meet DOD's requirements. Um, sometimes it's, it's not the case, and you really do need that you know, radar engineer who's been studying a thing for 25 years, and you know, they see stuff in what looks like the matrix to me. Um, in that case, you need to bring the tooling, not the, actual, not, not the underlying model, over to the department and then give it to that person to enable them to kind of do the work. Um, but we're seeing great fits for both of those things and actually really rapid acceleration of DOD's outcomes. The last part of that that I would just flag is, uh, I think it's very important to, flat, you know, to, to, to highlight, um, there's a big difference between figuring out how to buy a house and the consequences. You know, maybe there's huge consequences to you personally, versus something that could be involved with uh, you know, informing a decision maker who has a responsibility for 20 million Americans and 
and kind of their safety and security uh, uh, around that. So we should be clear, there are different stakes, and there does need to be regulatory oversight, uh, ethical considerations, and other things. And I think DOD is working through that, um, actually a pace to what I would hope they would be doing, um, and trying to govern in that way, but there's still some work to do. I want to go down that path in a second, but let me yep. just come back to one thing. I love the idea of we got to flip the paradigm around commander instead of spending 80% of their time working to get their data yep. and, and then making a decision, but spend any time using the data to make a decision. Is that those things that you mentioned, like Project Convergence, like Scarlet mm -hmm. Dragons, that's, that's what's showing them how to, how to flip the script? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think they're all in different places. I think um, Scarlet Dragon in particular, um, and kind of just riffing on some of the things that I think Colonel O'Callaghan had shared, um, is a place where you're very explicitly seeing that. You know, it's how do we make a thousand decisions in an hour, right? And it is about the decision. Right, it's ultimately that that end user goal that they're trying to achieve, um, and then I think things like project convergence are really a little bit more kind of forward leaning. They're trying to think about where do we need to be three to five years from now to have that decision advantage, and frankly, that that deterrence advantage in a lot of cases. Um, and uh, you know, I think that um, there there are aspects of it I can't speak to, but the things that I am aware of uh, are really cool and they're impressive, mm -hmm. and they kind of expand uh, 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 the scope of what we can do as a department. And then the commercial baseline piece, let's go down that path for a second because I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. This is the Zillow is something we all can relate to, but it's also, yeah. okay, you're buying a house, right? You're not, you're not attacking or, or defending. Yeah. Uh, is when it comes to, as, as you bring commercial ideas and services and, and technologies to DOD, what is their reaction? Are they, mm -hmm. okay, if we just make this 20% change or 10% change, or are they trying to still yeah. make the 50% or 80% change, which then, causes more complexity. Uh, I'll be honest, so most I, of- I know, there's yeah. no answer, yes, yeah, to no. everything. Uh, look, most of the folks I work with, or that we you know, we have the honor to work with, are, um, they're in more of the fight tonight camp, right? Um, again, whether on the business system side, on the operator side, or the analyst side. Um, there's something mission, mission critical and urgent that they're dealing with, and um, they want to go into that mission with the best possible tools and capabilities to win. Ultimately, right? They want every possible advantage, right? Nobody wants a fair fight. You want every, you know, unfair advantage you can take advantage of. Um, and so, um, so in, in most of those cases, I think what we see is that um, those folks are going to be the most discerning, and they're kind of probably going to be the most likely to take the ninety percent solution and adopt it mm -hmm. um, if they think it can give them some kind of advantage. Uh, I think what we're seeing for the longer term things, a lot of stuff the research labs are looking at and some of the, the futures folks is um, they're, they're, I would say half are saying, all right, let's, let's take the 50% advantage and start there. I, you know, we are seeing a lot of duplication. We're still seeing people who want to start from scratch. You know, I've had you know, folks uh, really pitch me hard and believe, look, you know, we need a completely you know, start at zero software and hardware supply chain to, in order to have a, um, a secure supply chain for those capabilities. And I, I believe there are actually certain missions where that is absolutely essential. I think they are few and far between, and I think they're really kind of like very, 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 very last mile capabilities um, in, in extreme situations. I think for the 99% of capability, or 99% of situations from what we've seen or what I've seen, um, Really, you can start with commercial baseline, probably like a 70% and, and go a lot faster. And we need that. We need the DOD and industry to be partnered. Uh, and, and you know, I think the, the company's been very direct about this. You know, we think uh, it's not about Silicon Valley versus Washington or anything like that. There's lots of great companies and extremely, extremely talented engineers that want to support and enable this mission uh, all over the country. And we should be taking advantage of them and creating opportunity for them. You mentioned supply chain, we could spend the whole show on the supply chain, so we won't go down that path. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there are regulations, there are ethical issues, there are things yeah. that the DOD is different than the commercial sector. Absolutely. How are they starting to deal with that? I mean, we, we know there's a lot of pushback on some AI use in the, over mm -hmm. the last few years. How, how are you starting to see DOD kind of recognize that? I know uh, ethics and AI, and there, there's mm -hmm. a, a, Jake, for instance, just named a new person who's in charge yep. mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, uh, of looking at and considering ethics and AI. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that Jake and some of the work Alka Patel had done prior in that space um, before I think she'd left the department. But um, I, I think that the Jake is helping there. I think that there's a lot of folks thinking about this on the NSC. I think there's a lot of folks just in OST generally thinking about it. Um, look, the thing that I strongly believe um, is, you know, I'm always going to bet on that warfighter, on that general, on that commander who has, if you will, that deep responsibility. Um, we need to make sure that the AI that we're building is thoughtful. 
that it is uh, that we're aware because it's very hard to pull bias out of data sets, but that we're aware of the biases that it's trained upon, that they're aware of the context that it's trained upon. Um, you know, Palantir has provided thoughts and feedback um, to NSCAI and to NIST and other organizations on how to do this well, and we have some good experience doing it. Um, but at the end of the day, this is kind of where that human in the loop is so critical uh, for where we are with AI right now, because AI is fallible. Let's be very clear, just like humans, uh, AI is fallible, and um, especially because the AI is only going to be as good as the data it is trained upon, and that data is also coming from sensors and capabilities that have errors. Um, you know, we need ultimately a human kind of for that that final decision to 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 make that decision. And I think the department has taken a pretty good stance on that. And I think what you're seeing from DoD is to address some of those ethical and bias considerations is really trying to improve their data. You mentioned David Absolutely. Markowitz, the, the Army CDO, mm -hmm. uh, David Spurk, the, the DOD CDO, yeah. also are, are starting to look at these governance issues as well as uh, how to say, okay, what's the taxonomy? Are we all, if we're yeah. calling a ship, a ship, a ship, what, what does that really mean to you, to me, and everybody else? So yeah. I, I think that's good. Um, let, let's maybe broaden this discussion out. How, when, when DOD's starting to look at AI, when you talked about use cases earlier a little bit, where do they see some of those big use cases? Because because yeah. DoD is all about you know they're, they're they're about fighting wars and protecting the nation and, and mm -hmm. you know their mission is is as clear as you know we have. Uh, of course, one could argue it's getting muddier sometimes, but sure. let's take it from the the military perspective and and protecting the nation, fighting wars. How is DoD starting to kind of think about it, that? Yeah, you know it's it's interesting in some of the early conversations with some of our AI work or supporting AI and DoD. One of the things that uh, was really reinforced with me is like, hey, just remember, it's the Department of Defense, right? It's the Department of Defense. We want to live in deterrence 100% of the time if we can. And I think that um, the department is, is trying to embrace AI as a mechanism to be a deterrent, right? And um, you, again, you see this with the notion of information dominance, right? With decision advantage, these types of terms, right? Sure, you need you know all domain command and control, in a defeat scenario or a scenario where you, you know you are in conflict, but by actually building those advanced capabilities um, and actually giving us the ability to make better decisions along the way, I think the hope is ultimately, especially with our peer-like adversaries, to deter. Right, and I think AI is a critical aspect of that. There's so much more we could talk to, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. we are out of time for today. So let me thank my guest, Aki Jane, is the Chief Technology Officer and President of U.S. Government for Palantir. Aki, I really, very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. I'm Jason Miller. You've been listening to the discussion, Technology and Great Power Competition, AI, Complexity, and Competition, sponsored by Palantir on Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Palantir.